Top 10 Myths About Evolution, Part 2. Hey, haven't you been to those museums showing modern man coming from ape men? It's incredible. You also ought to meet those with the artistic license. The pervasive ape to human montage that shows an ape like being on the left, slowly becoming a human on the right, is so much a part of culture that most anyone can recognize it. Natural history museums and TV shows give us supposed glimpses into the past and how human ancestors might have looked. Too bad it's all a sham. Fossil apes are difficult to come by, but several species have been found, no question. However, a new ape fossil does not generate as much interest or prestige as one called a human ancestor, which is why there is so much focus on how ape fossils tie into evolutionism. When I want to study one of the so-called missing links, I want to study the original bones. Not the replicas. Because, in doing so, minority scientists have found that these bones were either forged, put together as a lie, or misidentified. The desire to fill in the gaps leads to many false conclusions. For example, some of the supposed bipedal characteristics found in fossils are also found in apes today that are not bipedal. In fact, imagination, wishful thinking, and presuppositions influence a great deal of the reconstructions we find in liberal magazines, textbooks, and on TV. Enjoy the science, but don't be taken in by the fiction. Ken, I've looked all around me. There appears to be clear evidence of bad design, which proves evolution. It does appear as if we do look around us, and even in our own bodies, there are many structures that seem to show less than optimal design. What this means, to evolutionists, is that this proves there is no creator. After all, you'd say, a creator as intelligent as God would not have made imperfect designs. But debunking this myth requires very little effort. First of all, how can humans judge what is optimal design? Some designs require a balance of efficiency and effectiveness, as we find in the human eye, a structure perfectly suited for human life. Also, we would hardly expect a universe that has been cursed with disorder for over 6,000 years to maintain optimal design. The fact that we literally continue to survive up till this day, however, is evidence of how well the design at the beginning was. Finally, the broadening field of biomimetics, which is copying the design from nature, shows us that God's creation, even in its fallen state, offers a wealth of design potential and good design at that. Well you and I have vestigial organs in our bodies. That's incorrect. The argument goes, while evolution does its dirty work, it leaves behind vestiges of its machinations. Evolutionists claim that humans and other animals have leftover organs and DNA that prove the power of mutations and natural selection. In fact, this is often tooted as a powerful rebuttal to creationists. But the myth stops here. If an organ loses function, that means it just lost its function. <laughs> Often, however, reports of this kind are vague and based on evolutionary expectations. The appendix, for example, was once thought to be vestigial, but now we know its function. It is true that you can live without your appendix. But you're going to have a higher chance of quite a few diseases. Just because you can live without something, does not mean you don't need it. You can live without both your arms, both your legs and both your eyes. But that doesn't prove you don't need it. And the fact that you are still able to live without something proves the incredible design installed in your body by a supreme intelligence. One must wonder, in fact, how much evolutionary thought has retarded science by claiming that things are no longer needed. In the end, the loss of function, after all other possibilities have been eliminated, is better evidence for a world that is in decay, which is exactly what the Bible says about the universe we inhabit. Well, and the biotic resistance is clear evidence for the theory of evolution. Well, the development and spread of antibiotic-resistant bacteria and pesticide-resistant plants and insects is shouted from the rooftops as proof of evolution happening right now. Selection pressures push these organisms to evolve, at least, this is how the evolutionist explains it. Do bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics? Yes. This is actually real science. Does this prove Darwinian evolution? No, not even close. 
Once again, evolutionists start with the assumption that evolution is true, and they make all the observations fit the assumption. The problem, for them, is that the mutations that cause bacteria and other organisms to overcome environmental pressures are not the information-gaining mutations required for Darwin's assumption. In fact, these mutations often come at a steep price to the organism. A price that doesn't show up until the environmental pressure is removed, and it often means the inability to compete with non-mutant bacteria. Bacteria, in fact, show the amazing creativity of God Almighty, in that they can swap DNA with other bacteria. This amazing feature reveals the provisions God made for them to survive in a fallen world in rapidly changing environments. However, they do not, and cannot evolve into anything else. They have been, and will always be, bacteria. Well I try listening to everything you say, but I still believe in evolution. Well, if you believe in evolutionism, you believe that you evolved by chance processes, correct? Well if you evolved by chance, then that means your brain evolved by chance also, right? Now if your brain evolved by chance, that means your processes of logic also evolved by chance, so if your logic evolved by chance, you can't be sure it evolved the right way. You don't even know if you're asking me the right questions. <laughs>